FBI search at President Biden's Delaware Beach House, did they find any classified documents? The goodbye to Tyree Nichols, remembered as a loving son, brother, and father. His family sharing their pain with the country. A special police unit similar to the one disbanded in Memphis focuses on high crime areas and building trust within the community. Our Victor Akendo is in Florida with this elite force. Boris Johnson on U.S. soil, my exclusive sit down with the former U.K. prime minister about the monarchy, his political future, and the war in Ukraine. He, with conventional forces, has invaded and is trying to subjugate and destroy a completely innocent country. Do you think he's unhinged? Uh, what's his mindset? Do you know, I think the less we talk about him, the better. The end of an era, for real this time. A look back at one of the best professional sports careers of all time. And how the talent and drive of black entertainers like Lena Horne helped to build Vegas into what it is today. Don't know why There's no sun up in the sky Stormy weather Stormy weather, appropriate music for Texas tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're tracking those stories and the deadly ice storm causing major problems across the country tonight. Thousands of flights canceled and the shooting spree on the metro in Washington, D.C. and the Good Samaritans who helped stop the gunmen. But we begin tonight with President Biden under more scrutiny as we learn about a new FBI search at a different one of his properties. Agents were seen today outside of the president's vacation home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. This is now the third site search for classified documents to see if the president has any more. This comes as the Justice Department special counsel is looking into how classified materials ended up at Biden's properties. But tonight, the president's lawyer says that no documents with classified markings were found at this location. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from the White House. This morning, cameras catching the FBI arriving at President Biden's Delaware Beach home, where for three and a half hours they combed through every room. The White House says the president cooperated fully. Today, uh, in a planned uh, consensual search with the Justice Department, they went through the Rehoboth uh, Beach House uh, and no classified uh, marked documents were found. But the FBI did take some of Biden's handwritten notes from his time as vice president for further review. It comes 24 hours after we learned that agents searched the president's former private office back in November after Biden's lawyers found classified documents there. Today, we pressed the spokesman for the White House counsel's office on why the American people were informed about today's search, but not about the one in November. You're disclosing this search, but you did not disclose that the FBI also searched the president's former private office here in Washington. Do the American people have a right to know about that? Yeah, I think we've been pretty transparent from the very beginning with providing information as it uh, occurs throughout this uh, process. But why didn't you disclose I, I that think search? It's important to, to understand that as these things develop and as information develops throughout an investigation, we're trying to get you guys access to as much information as we can. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, today was the first day on the job for the special counsel investigating the matter. What's the White House saying about if the president would be willing to sit down with him? Well, Lindsay, the White House isn't really giving a straight answer on this. They won't say whether the president would or would not sit down for an interview with the special counsel if requested. Instead, they are saying they don't want to get ahead of this investigation, but they are stressing that the president so far has been fully cooperative, and they say that cooperation will continue. Lindsay. All right. Mary Bruce from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Loved ones of Tyree Nichols celebrated his life before a final goodbye today. The young father remembered for his love of skateboarding and photography and one of the most heartbreaking sights, his weeping mother describing her son through her pain. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is in Memphis for us tonight. Tonight, the family of Tyree Nichols laying the 29-year-old to rest three weeks after he died following a brutal police beating captured on disturbing video. Tyree was a beautiful person. And for this to happen to him, it's just unimaginable. Nichols, remembered by his family as a loving father, a beautiful soul who enjoyed skateboarding and sunsets. His sister, Kiana. I see the world showing him love and fighting for his justice. But all I want is my baby brother back. In the congregation, family members of George Floyd, Eric Gardner, Botham Jean, and Breonna Taylor, all of whom died at the hands of police. Vice President Kamala Harris in Memphis as well, embracing Tyree Nichols' mother before addressing the crowd. This violent act was not in pursuit of public safety. That's right. That's right. That's right. It was not 
in the interest of keeping the public safe? Was he not also entitled to the right to be safe? Reverend Al Sharpton with strong words against those five former Memphis police officers seen beating Nichols. In the city that Dr. King lost his life, not far away from that balcony, you beat a brother to death. Both Harris and Sharpton calling on Congress to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which calls for comprehensive police reform. Harris saying President Biden will sign it. Why do we want to see the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act passed? Because then you have to think twice for you beat Tyree Nichols. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And Stephanie, speaking of that, are any steps being taken to reintroduce the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? There are, Lindsay. So Attorney Ben Crump says that Representative Sheila Jackson Lee plans to reintroduce the bill after the State of the Union and will also include a Tyree Nichols duty to intervene clause. And I do want to mention that today, right here at the church, Vice President Harris hand delivered a letter to the parents of Tyree Nichols from President Biden. In it, he writes, their love for Tyree will be the source of their strength. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos for us. Our thanks to you. A shooting spree at a Washington, D.C. metro station claimed the life of a hero worker who stepped up to stop it. Three people were hurt before even more Good Samaritans were able to intervene. Here's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. The morning commute in Washington, D.C. today erupting into gunfire and descending into chaos, with one person killed and three others injured. I got one person down, not conscious. Not breathing. Around 9 a.m., an argument on a Metro bus carrying over to the street. Police say the gunman, described as an African-American male, shoots the victim in the leg, who then escapes. Moments later, that suspect confronts a man trying to buy a subway ticket inside a normally quiet Metro station in the southeast. Uh, my victim is stating the suspect approached him outside the turnstile gate, grabbed a hold of him, shot him in the leg. That victim also able to get away, but it's not over. The suspect approaching a woman, two Metro workers noticing and trying to intervene. But police say the shooter takes aim at one of the workers and fires. He actually was shot um, back of his head as well. He's unconscious. He's giving uh, CPR right now. 64-year-old Robert Cunningham, a Metro mechanic, dies. The shooter then boards a sitting train, brandishing his firearm before commuters tackle him, apparently dislodging that weapon which falls onto the train tracks. Authorities say a third victim suffers minor injuries. Police later arriving and arresting the suspect. Do the heroic actions of our, our citizens, our community, uh, to disarm this shooter, uh, I can't put a price on that. I, I think they save lives. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, what have you learned about Robert Cunningham, who lost his life trying to protect others? Well, he was a mechanic and apparently a beloved uh, member of the staff of the Metro. Uh, tonight, officials are saying that he acted with extreme bravery to help save that customer, Lindsay. Is there any word on a motive? They have not even identified the suspect, much less given a motive. Nothing yet. All right, Pierre Thomas for us. Thanks so much, Pierre. A deadly ice storm is still hammering parts of the country. Icy roads have been blamed for the deaths of at least six people. And tonight, more than 350,000 families and businesses are without power during this bitter cold. This weather has caused more than 5,000 flights to be canceled since Sunday. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking the storm. But first, our Maria Villarreal has the latest in Texas. Tonight, roads are like sheets of glass. Drivers spinning their wheels. On this curve south of Fort Worth, vehicle after vehicle going off the road. This pickup struggling to get back on the pavement. After hundreds of spinouts and accidents this week, tonight officials say the death toll on Texas roads has risen to at least six. When dozens of semis got stuck on I-20 in Dallas Tuesday, an army of Jeeps from a local off-road club sprang into action, hooking themselves together with tow ropes pulling those semis one by one. My dad's a trucker and I feel for them and I know I, I want to do everything I can to help them out. And I know they, the rest of the guys do too. In Austin, tree limbs snapping under the weight of ice. 
north of there, crews racing to clear blocked streets and repair utility lines torn by ice encrusted trees. Across the state, more than 300,000 customers don't have power tonight. Across the country, airlines canceling more than 5,000 flights since the storms began. The residual effects could last days. Treacherous not just for the drivers, but by the looks of it for pedestrians on the sidewalk there. Maria Villarreal joins us now from Dallas. Maria, when do officials think that the roads will be safe for travel? Well, you know, Lindsay, the uh, freezing rain just started to come down once again. It is expected to go throughout the night, and it could create black ice on both the sidewalks and the roadways, creating those treacherous conditions you just mentioned. You know, it is dangerous. It is deadly, and it's the reason why I'm not going to move from this spot right here. All of that is expected throughout the morning into rush hour. So really, drivers are being told uh, you probably won't get on the roadway safely until midday tomorrow. It's clearly been a very long week for people living in this area. People need to stay put if possible. All right, Maria Villarreal, our thanks to you. Let's get to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking where this storm is headed next. Hey, Rob. Hey, Lindsay, you know, this cold air is still stuck at the surface. We're getting a third and final pulse tonight and tomorrow that will finally, finally help scour out uh, some of that cold air. But we still have ice storm warnings that are posted. Check it out from uh, the Tennessee Valley through Arkansas, across the Mississippi, and all the way back through the Rio Grande. The, and the flood watch to boot because some heavy rain's coming. But right now, it's a lighter rain over top of that cold air, I-35, I-20 I as well, and then uh, all the way up through Oklahoma City. So more icing tonight. Uh, we're, uh, where we're looking at uh, Dallas and in through Little Rock. And watch the heavy rain eastern parts of Texas through Louisiana. That's where the flood watch is out. But that stronger wave is going to help scour out, mix up this cold air, and help turn it all over to rain by tomorrow night after giving another icing pulse through Memphis. But heavy rain late tomorrow and tomorrow night through Alabama, Georgia, in through the Carolinas. Then it gets into the Atlantic and will actually help pull down from Canada some really cold stuff into the Northeast. Wind chills Saturday morning are going to be really eye-popping, to say the least. Minus 10 in Manhattan, minus 23 in the capital of Albany, 33 below in Boston, and then you're talking 40s and 50 below in, uh, in parts of Maine for wind chills. And in that state, that could be in spots some of the coldest air they've seen in decades. So everybody getting a piece as we head into the first very cold week of February. Lindsay? Yeah, those numbers just astonishing there in Maine. All right, Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. Tonight, we're learning embattled Congressman George Santos is now being investigated by the FBI. This comes after the FBI contacted a Navy veteran who is part of an investigation into Santos and a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for the veteran's service dog. The vet, Richard Ostoff, told ABC News that Santos did not come through with the money supposedly raised under a charity called Friends of Pets United for his dog's surgery to remove a tumor. He said, quote, I don't ever want to see another person, especially another veteran, go through this again. Santos has denied knowing Ostoff, but GoFundMe has confirmed to ABC News that account was in fact his. Turning now back to Washington in the high stakes meeting at the White House between President Biden and Speaker Kevin McCarthy, their first face to face meeting since Republicans took control of the House. This meeting was focused on that looming debt ceiling showdown and the need to raise the country's borrowing limit in order to prevent a default. Let's bring in ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Rachel, Speaker McCarthy left the White House sounding optimistic. Let's take a listen. We had an hour conversation about this that I thought was a very good discussion and we we walked out saying we would continue the discussion. And I think there is an opportunity here to come to an agreement on both sides. And I think that's the best for the, I think that's what the American people want. Look, they want us to be responsible and sensible about this. And that's exactly the way we've handling it. What more did McCarthy say and how is the White House responding to today's meeting? Well, Lindsay, the White House tonight says that the conversation was frank and straightforward. But look, these are really tough conversations that the president is having with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. And both sides here are playing hardball right now. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy insists that he will not raise the debt limit until the president commits to spending cuts. Well, in a statement tonight, the White House says the president welcomes a separate discussion with congressional leaders on how to reduce the deficit and control the national debt. But they made it clear that this should be done without any negotiation or any conditions. And now Congress has worked together, Republicans and Democrats alike, largely over the last 80 years to raise the debt limit. And tonight, the White House is insisting that Congress has an obligation to do it once again, Lindsay. All right, we'll see how it all plays out. Rachel Scott from the Capitol for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. 
Ukrainian authorities have conducted a series of high-profile corruption raids across the country. The former deputy minister of defense is among three top officials charged with corruption. The anti-corruption raid took place after President Zelensky and the head of the parliamentary faction of his party to bring corrupt officials to justice. And it, it comes ahead of the Ukraine-EU summit on Friday as fighting corruption is one of the key demands for Ukraine to be able to join the European Union. Now to our exclusive sit-down interview with former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Johnson resigned as Prime Minister in the UK back in July after a series of scandals, including hosting parties during the COVID-19 lockdown. Here in the US, though, Johnson is squarely focused on Ukraine and asking the government here to stay firm on its financial commitment to it that it's made as far as the war effort is concerned. Here's the first part of our wide-ranging conversation on Ukraine, Putin, the monarchy, and Johnson's political future. Hello. Prime Minister. Lindsay, and Lindsay, how, how are you? you? Very, very nice very to meet you. Very, very honoured to be invited on oh, your show. Of course, thank you thank so you much so for much joining for us. Time. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on U.S. soil, here to urge Republican lawmakers and the U.S. as a whole to stay the course with aid to Ukraine. Just back from Ukraine. Yes. Tell me about what struck you the most. I just think the extent of the of the damage. Is, I, it's, I was just in the outskirts of, of Kiev, but I saw such an incredible, catastrophic uh, loss of, uh, of you know the economy has been absolutely trashed. Uh, the, the suffering is is colossal. The world is in massively in the debt of the United States for helping the Ukrainians to fight this war. But number two, it is massively in the interests of the United States to see this thing through and to get victory for the Ukrainians. You recently penned an op-ed and the last line was, let's give Ukrainians what they need to win now. Yeah. What do they need most? I, 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 I could, look, I could read out a whole list of the stuff that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky wants, but I want to reassure people in America that this is not going to be just a conflict that goes on forever. What brought you here to DC? I'm here really to, to make it clear to American lawmakers, uh, to the people of America as far as I'm able, how deeply grateful I think we in the UK, everybody in Europe uh, is to, to the United States for, for what, what you've done. I mean, look at it. This is uh, a war that could so easily have gone the other way. Putin could have crushed this country. And what happened? The United States stepped in gave the assistance, gave the training, gave the intelligence to help the Ukrainians to defend themselves. And that was a magnificent thing to do, absolutely magnificent. And all I want to say is that the United States, I hope, will stick with it. Are you getting that sense of support yeah, today I, when you met with Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell? I did. You know, it, I, so everywhere I've, I've, everybody I've talked to, I, I talked to, uh, to, to Speaker McCarthy, I talked to um, Mitch McConnell, loads of people. And I find a bipartisan support, as, as, as you know. And yeah, there are some people who are concerned about the, the cost, some people who are concerned about the plan. But I think in the end, everybody can see that this is a absolutely overwhelmingly important cause. Boris Johnson has it right when it comes to Russia, uh, Putin, and the Ukraine. This is a pivotal moment in the, the 21st century. People will look back at the war in Ukraine. They will say, well, actually, the West stood up for itself, and America did what it did in the, in the 1930s and, and 1940s, and actually came across and upheld the values of freedom and democracy and made the difference. What do you say to those Republicans who are uh, opposing sending more money. I mean, we heard in November, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, she's a staunch Republican, said not another penny will go to Ukraine. Congressman Matt Gates tweeted, I will not vote for one more dollar to Ukraine. What do you say to those Republicans who so strongly oppose additional aid to Ukraine? I just think that it's a, it's a massive uh, investment. It's, it's, it's cheap at, the, at, at, at double the price. Because what you're doing, and I'm speaking just in purely financial or economic terms, you talk about the, talk about the money. Uh, the, yes, the, the United States has made a big financial commitment, but it is a fraction of the defense budget. Will you meet with President Biden while you're here? I'm sort of, no, I'm, I'm, a mere, I'm a mere backbencher now. In November, in an interview, you said that when it came to Ukraine that you felt President Biden was doing an absolutely wonderful job. Would you still say the same? 
I, I think that uh, un, uh, despite the enormous pressures that the United States has been under, for the, the fiscal pressures that we've all been under, I think the, United, the leadership of the United States has been fantastic. And I think Joe has done a great job, but it's been, it's been bipartisan. Just this past Saturday, Donald Trump at a rally said, if I were president, there would not have been a war in Russia and Ukraine. Zero chance. He went on to say, I would have a peace deal negotiated within 24 hours. You could make a peace deal for both right now, 24 hours. Do you agree with either statement? I, I, look, I mean, the, the president, the former president, uh, Donald, is a, he's a great deal maker, but I don't think there's a deal here. There was a snippet of the BBC documentary that was recently uh, released uh, where you say that, that Putin said to you on the phone, Boris, I don't want to hurt you, but with a missile, it would only take a minute. How did you respond? Yeah, I, I thought he, he it was, a, it was a sort of, he was trying to creep me out, right, in, in a sort of playful way. And talk, he was really talking about the dangers of a, of, a, of a missile exchange. I think that the crucial thing with all this is not to get sucked into that argument. Do you think he's unhinged? Uh, what's his mindset? Do you know, I think... The less we talk about him, the better. Just a quick question, because we're talking about, uh, we've been talking about uh, with Harry and all of that and the Queen passing away. Do yes. you think that the monarchy should have a different role in the future in the UK? I think that one of the great achievements of Her Late Majesty the Queen was that she, she, she greatly modernised the monarchy and did a, a huge amount to stabilise it and to prepare her son for kingship. And actually, I think, that he's doing an absolutely bang-up job at the moment, and everybody can see it. And so, you know, I know that here in the United States you decided in 1776, for reasons that I you know, can't fully explain, that you could rub along without the monarchy. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was your call. Uh, but we think it works very Did well. Did it work out too well, poorly? <laughs> well, I think, it, I think our system works well. I'll tell you why. Because what you have is a division between the political authority and the figurehead who incarnates all that's good, all that's wonderful about the history of the, of the nation. And when those two roles are kind of bound up in one, constitutionally, that can be quite a pressure on whoever is supposed to occupy the office. And, and so having a, a monarch is a, is, a, is a great thing for our country. When you left Parliament as Prime Minister, of course, you famously repeated the, the quote of Arnold Schwarzenegger with hasta la vista, baby. Yeah, right. Uh, many people thought that was a nod to a, another quote from the Terminator character that I'll be back. Any chance? Coming up in our next hour, you'll hear Johnson's answer to that question and more on why he thinks that additional Ukraine aid is so crucial. That's all coming up in our next hour. A New York City woman has been charged with using cryptocurrency to provide financial support to terrorist groups in Syria. The 11-count indictment charged 43-year-old Victoria Jacobs with providing support for an act of terrorism, money laundering, and other crimes. According to a statement from the Manhattan District Attorney, it's one of the rare cases worldwide where cryptocurrency is alleged to have financed terrorism. Next tonight, to the critical testimony in the trial of once prominent South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch, accused of murdering his own wife and son. Prosecutors today laid out a detailed timeline of events that uh, events that day and another jam-packed day in court. Eva Pilgrim is on the case for us once again tonight. Tonight, Alec Murdoch's alibi potentially destroyed by his son's own video. Get back. Get back. Prosecutors revealing a 58-second cell phone video recorded by Paul Murdoch directly contradicting Alec Murdoch's story, placing him at the murder scene minutes before his wife and son were shot to death. In the video, you can see Paul going into a pen on the family's property to check on a friend's dog. In the background, you hear other voices. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Come here, Cash. Come here, Bob. Cash. Quit. Murdoch claimed he didn't go to the family's kennels that night until he found his wife and son's bodies. I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. In emotional testimony, close family friend Rogan Gibson recalling how he talked to Paul Murdoch that night about his injured dog. Paul telling him he'd take a video. Did you hear any other voices when you were on the phone with Paul about 840? I did. And what voices did you hear? I heard Miss Maggie. 
And who else did you hear? And I thought it was Mr. Alec that I heard. Cell phone records show Paul took that video right after that call. Minutes later, he and his mother were dead. Did you ever get that video? I did not. Police later showed Gibson that video from inside the kennel. And what voices did you hear? Paul's, Miss Maggie, Miss Taylor. And how sure are you now? Positive. 100 percent? That's correct. Prosecutors playing that video for him again in court. Can you point out Alec Murdoch, the person whose voice you recognize in this video in this courtroom, please? Sitting right there in a great jacket. But the defense pushing back, painting a portrait of a happy family. And they were loving to each other and, and to Paul and Buster and their friends, correct? That's correct. And you can, can you think of any circumstance that you can envision, knowing them as you do, where Alec would brutally murder Paul and Maggie? Not that I can think of. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. Eva, we heard from a state cell phone expert in court today. What did they have to say? Uh, Lindsay, that cell phone expert tested that Alec Murdoch's call logs in the days leading up to the murders were missing. He said it appeared Murdoch deleted that data. Lindsay? Oh, the plot thickens there. Eva, our thanks to you. New York City officially declared an end to the MPOX outbreak today. The declaration comes as the U.S. public health emergency expired yesterday. The city, once the epicenter of the outbreak, launched a number of response strategies, including successfully vaccinated more than 100,000 New Yorkers. MPOX, formerly known as monkeypox, is a rare viral disease that can spread to anyone through close skin-to-skin -skin contact. Superstar quarterback Tom Brady has once again announced his retirement from the NFL, this time with an emotional video. Let's take a look. I'll get to the point right away. I'm retiring. My family, my friends, my teammates, my competitors. Uh, I could go on forever. There's too many. Um, thank you guys for allowing me to live my absolute dream. I wouldn't change a thing. The seven-time Super Bowl champion took to social media for the announcement, claiming this time it's for good. Exactly one year ago today, he announced his retirement, only to return to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for one final season. When we come back, an alleged case of animal abuse, the dozens of pets officially, officials say that they rescued from an overcrowded mobile home. The revision is being made to a high school African-American history course after it received backlash from Florida's governor. But first, the disbanding of the Scorpion unit in Memphis is leading to even louder calls to dissolve similar groups at other police departments. Our Victor Kendo gets an inside look at the ghost unit in West Palm Beach. Do they have the most dangerous jobs on the force? I will say yes, they deal with probably the most um, violent people because they're the high crime they're in a high crime area America's number one news ABC News most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're I love it. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the scene of the Monterey Park mass shooting, I'm Juju Chang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. As Memphis gathered for Tyree Nichols' celebration of life, one city in South Florida is holding their own police department accountable, specifically when it comes to a specialized unit similar to the one under a spotlight after Tyree Nichols' death. The West Palm Beach Police Department says they meet the community where they're at. Our Victor Kendo went along for the ride. These officers are part of a special unit called GHOST, Gang and Habitual Offender Suppression Team, focusing on high crime areas. Within minutes of leaving West Palm Beach Police Headquarters... So you're going in to assist? We're going to assist. A call for a stolen vehicle came in, and we were in pursuit. We're behind a uh, signal tent. The ghost unit is made up of about 12 experienced officers who go through additional training once selected, including field tactics. They're similar to the now disbanded Scorpion unit in Memphis behind the brutal beating and death of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols, where five officers were fired and charged with murder, putting police reform back in the spotlight. There have been calls to disband units like these, but you feel like this ghost team does serve a good purpose. Serve a good purpose, and, you know, we don't, we're not getting calls in our city to disband it. I mean, I think if you go to some of these community meetings, they want more of them. They don't want less. Uh, Chief of Police from City of West Palm Beach. How could we prevent what happened in Memphis to not happen here in Palm Beach County? Confidence and trust within the community is key to good policing. Just think of what that notable difference it would make in this community. He has an open-door policy and regularly holds town halls, this week at a predominantly black church with concerned residents in the wake of Tyree Nichols' death. They want crime stamped and out properly. Why was it so important for you to be out here tonight? I think on the um, cusp of what's happened over in Memphis, it was important to kind of know locally what our uh, law enforcement heads felt, thought, wanted to really just get an idea as to whether or not they are tone deaf to some of the agony and um, confusion that a lot of us have in the community. Having the chief take questions directly from the people in the community, is that how trust gets built? I think that's the beginning. Um, I think the chief challenging his officers to do what some of the citizens talked about, get out of the cars, have those one-on-one -on -one conversations like he's doing. But leadership starts it off. But this is definitely a good start. Are there any Scorpion units here in West Palm Beach? The first two questions tonight were about what happened in Memphis. Is that what you were expecting? We, we kind of expected that would happen, but at the same time, Chief's objective, my objective as a servant to this community, let's talk about how to prevent what happened in Memphis from happening here in West Palm Beach. So I think that played out perfectly. Chief Adderley says he holds his officers accountable, firing several throughout his four years as the head of the department. We really seriously look at the use of force. We look at complaints, and that's something that's being reviewed on a daily basis. Back to the pursuit of the stolen car in West Palm Beach. We're not allowed to chase. The team standing down once they decided the chase put members of the public at risk. Moments later, they spotted two men in a park that was closed and smelled what they believed was marijuana as they drove by. They called for backup. Is this an area that you guys are typically called yes. out to? 
Yes, sir. At the end of the day, nobody wants their kids to go to the park and have people doing drugs and having guns when they're not supposed to. And it's not a, it's not a safe environment for anybody. So at this park, you barely see any kids because of that exact reason. And it sucks. With another ghost unit alongside, they approach both men and search for narcotics. He had the marijuana and search incident to arrest. We locate uh, crack cocaine. This is part of the reason why you guys are part of this ghost team. Yes, Take sir. care of stuff like this. Absolutely. Make the community safer for all. Definitely. Our thanks to Victor for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the consequences for a football coach who's accused of pretending to be a player on her JV squad. Decades ago, they couldn't even stay in hotels where they performed, but now black performers are selling out theaters in Las Vegas and paying tribute to the entertainers who paved the way. Tom Brady bids a final farewell to his pro football career. We take a closer look at his legendary career by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic, We're baby. making magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> it was like working with a 40 year old child. The housewife scam, the real life of Jen Shaw. Money. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw, a fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Chicago, I'm Alex Perez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Superstar quarterback Tom Brady has announced his retirement from the NFL again. Let's take a look at his incredible career by the numbers. Two, that's the number of times that Brady has now retired, but this time he says it's for good. It was exactly one year ago today that he said that he was walking away from the game, but 40 days later, Brady backtracked and returned for his third season with the Tampa Bay Bucks. In his 23 seasons with the Patriots and the Bucks, Brady won a record seven Super Bowl rings and five Super Bowl MVP awards. No other player has won more than five Super Bowls. At 45 years old, Brady walks away with multiple NFL records, including throwing for 89,214 yards in the regular season, as well as 649 touchdowns. Brady was famously underrated to start his career, selected with the 199th pick in the sixth round of the 2000 draft behind six other quarterbacks, three kickers and a punter. And he played in only one game during his rookie season with the Pats. While Brady says that he wouldn't change a thing about his career, his delayed retirement may have contributed to the end of his 
13 years of marriage to supermodel Giselle Bündchen. The couple finalized their divorce this fall at the start of the Bucks season, which ended with a lackluster first round playoff defeat. So what comes next for Brady? He's heading to the announcing booth. Last summer, he signed a 10-year, $375 million contract to serve as a Fox Sports game analyst. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. More layoffs, the latest company to announce it's cutting back on some key roles. And Beyonce is going back on tour, how she may be trying to avoid any ticket sale chaos. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> <laughs> it was like working with a 40 year old child. The housewife scam, the real life of Jen Shaw. Money. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw, a fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. An urgent manhunt coming to an end in Oregon. Police say Benjamin Foster, accused of attempted murder and now murder, died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound after a standoff with officers. Police finding Foster at a crime scene in Grants Pass on Tuesday, where authorities say last week the 36-year-old tortured, beat, and bound a woman identified as Justine Siemens. They discovered Foster buried below the home, injured from a single bullet wound. Not too far away, police also finding two people murdered inside a home. They believe Foster was the killer. Authorities in North Carolina rescued dozens of animals from a home, including more than 40 dogs. The Buncombe County Sheriff's Office says a search warrant was served at the home Tuesday, with the local ASPCA spending eight hours removing the animals. The ASPCA said some of the other animals included a tortoise, rabbit, fish, and several birds, all of whom were allegedly living in an overcrowded mobile home. Lindsay Trevor Rue faces multiple felony animal abuse charges in the case, but with officials saying more charges may be coming as the investigation continues. Scandal on the court in Virginia in this junior varsity girls basketball game with a coach posing as a player. The player in the black jersey wearing number one was no player at all. She's Arlisha Boykins, a member of the Churchland Truckers coaching staff. Boykins suiting up and playing as if she were a student in a weekend game against the Nansemond River Warriors last month. When, when adults commit to being a coach, they take on a lot of responsibility. 
adults who fail to live up to those expectations fail our students. The district says Arlisha Boykins is no longer an employee. Her last day of work was January 25th. The College Board has released its official framework for the incoming AP African American Studies course. The release comes after weeks of debate and criticism over its content, with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis attempting to block the course from Florida schools. The current framework is missing some of the more controversial materials that angered conservatives, including lessons on black queer studies, Black Lives Matter, and critical race theory. The course has been piloted in 60 schools during this school year and will be piloted to hundreds more in the next academic year, with all schools allowed to start offering the course in the 2024-2025 school year. FedEx is the latest major company to announce layoffs. The delivery company said it would be laying off more than 10% of its officer and director teams and consolidating some of its teams and functions. In a message sent to FedEx team members, President and CEO Rod Supermanium says the changes were necessary to become a more efficient, agile organization and the moves were a part of an effort to better align the size of FedEx's network with customer demand. You won't break my soul. You won't break my soul. Queen B is back. Beyonce took to Instagram to announce her upcoming Renaissance World Tour, spanning stadiums across Europe and North America. The tour is her first since she co-headlined the On the Run 2 tour with her husband Jay-Z in 2018, and her first solo headlining tour since the Formation Tour in 2016. It's also Beyonce's first tour following the release of her latest album, Renaissance, which garnered her nine nominations at the upcoming Grammy Awards. The tour's first stop is May 10th in Stockholm, and it's currently slated to run through the end of September. Tickets will go on sale next week and will be staggered across different dates, possibly to avoid a ticket system meltdown like the ones that have plagued other big artists. A 19-year-old is accused of scamming well-wishers on TikTok out of thousands of dollars after lying about having a cancer diagnosis. The problem is not only does she not have cancer, according to authorities, it's also a felony. Our Trevor Alt has the story. I am too sick from treatment where I, I can't go anywhere. I, I can't do anything. Um, Iowa you know, TikToker accused of you know, faking a cancer crazy. diagnosis, just, charged with stealing from people who donated to help her battle a disease authorities say she doesn't have. Investigators say Madison Russo took more than $37,000 from Maddie's fight against pancreatic cancer. A GoFundMe set up on her behalf, captured by ABC affiliate WQAD, that's now been taken down. This week is... Uh, not a chemo week, it's just a radiation week. Authorities allege Russo spent the past year claiming she'd been diagnosed with leukemia, stage 2 pancreatic cancer, and a tumor the size of a football that wrapped around her spine. Posting dozens of photos and videos like this, she's since taken down, now reposted on TikTok by another user. So it's my week off chemo, so I've just been doing um, radiation. Police tell us they're reviewing all of Russo's posts as part of the investigation. In a press release saying witnesses with medical experience pointed out the many medical discrepancies, including terrible, life-threatening inaccuracies of her medical equipment placement on her body. So you can see that the actual positioning of the port, per se, is not accurate. Also, that the way that it's secured, the type of tape that's used, is not the same clinical tape that we would use in the hospital. Authorities say Russo's subpoenaed medical records show she She's never been diagnosed with any kind of cancer or tumor, but her alleged lies reached so far her story was featured in a local Iowa paper, and she even did outreach for the National Pancreas Foundation. That organization now tells ABC News there are thousands of patients, families, and caregivers battling this terrible disease, and Miss Russo's actions have taken away valuable resources from these patients. Louis Frillman is one of hundreds who gave to the GoFundMe supporting Russo. His $500 donation has been refunded. My thinking is say a prayer for this young kid because she's going to have a lot of terrible consequences. Seems like it. Our thanks to Trevor. Nominees for the 2023 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame have been revealed, and the list reflects a diverse selection of artists and their music. Many of this year's contenders are receiving their first nomination, including Missy Elliott, The White Stripes, Cindy Lauper, and Willie Nelson. Fan voting is open now through April 28th at rockhall.com. Fans will help determine this year's inductees, who will be announced in May.
These days, it's not uncommon for black entertainers to be celebrated on the Las Vegas Strip, but decades ago, they couldn't even stay at the hotels where they performed. Soul of a Nation presents Black in Vegas, taking a deeper look at the groundbreaking musicians and actors who paved the way for the current generation. Lena Horne was one of the first huge black artists. She was a beautiful black woman. Lena Horne came here in the 1940s, when her career is taking off. She is already performing in movies, so she is well known. Even when singing a beautiful song, like my Aunt Marion's favorite, Stormy Weather. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky. She would just bring this emotion and this grit, and she would express her rage with the fact that she knew that she was different and being treated different. Her first job at the Flamingo, she wanted, of course, to stay in the hotel. And so Bugsy Siegel, who owned the Flamingo at that period, agreed that she could stay in the hotel. And the story goes, that in the morning her sheets would be burned. But she was important enough to stay here when African Americans could not. Now, they didn't have total access to Vegas, but at least it got to the point where they could stay where they were playing. It was a risk that they all took to, to open those doors. In 1952, Josephine Baker does a tour. She is a sexy cabaret performer. But when she gets to Las Vegas, it is really phenomenal what she does. Josephine Baker said that she wouldn't perform unless there's some people of color in the audience, because that's where you get your soul and your spirit from your people out there that's rooting you on. So they had to scramble to find black people to be able to sit in the audience for a show. And I think that was history that was made. Presenting the incomparable Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole was a barrier breaker, too. He was the first black man to ever have a TV show. Nat King Cole was one of the hottest entertainers in the world. And he comes to Las Vegas. In 1960, Nat King Cole agreed to take a gig at the Sands Hotel, not just because he could stay there, but he demanded his whole entourage, band included, could stay there. And they obliged. Somewhere along. On this clip on the Nat King Cole show with Sammy Davis Jr., there was chemistry, there was camaraderie, there was a bromance, and they could actually touch each other, which was something Nat King Cole couldn't always do when he had white guests on his show. So here's a, a black man with a television show, and he cannot get close to a guest if that guest is a white woman. When I saw the clip, it makes me think how free they seemed to be together. The friends we used to know. <laughs> Matt had an innate dignity. He was not afraid to be supportive of any performer. He helped my career tremendously. But let me do one for you that we haven't done. This is from Dream Girls. And I am telling you, it's such an interesting song for Sammy as somebody who, you know, went from segregated Vegas to desegregated Vegas. He's telling them, and I am telling you, Tonight, I'm not going. I'm going to lay my head down and rest right here at this resort. I am staying and dig you, you, you. Nat King Cole and all the civil rights leaders that aided them in desegregating Vegas, you had a whole new generation of acts in the 70s that began to reap those benefits. So you had Lola Falana and the Fifth Dimension. Lola Falana becomes the black female entertainer of Las Vegas. During this time in the 70s, it was reported that Lola Falana was making $100,000 a week in Las Vegas. I mean, that's pretty good today. There's this signature performance of Lola Falana. This is where you I love the costuming that Lola Falana wore on stage. It's still having impact all these years later. Recently, on the BET Awards, Money Long performed, and she paid homage to Lola Falana. I'm a power. You give me a super power. Together the world could be ours. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. We recorded Aquarius faster than any other song. We were performing in Las Vegas when we recorded it. In 1969, The Fifth Dimension released their biggest hit, Aquarius, Let the Sunshine In. We were 
performing nightly when we had a residency at Las Vegas. When The Fifth Dimension was nominated for five Grammys, we were so excited. We won three that night. Group of the Year, Album of the Year, Song of the Year. <laughs> they may be a great example of one of the first black pop groups, first black crossover groups, because their music was very broad and wide-reaching. As you get into the 80s and 90s and 2000s, you're driving down the strip, you see these big billboards and lights for Lionel Richie, for Smokey Robinson, for Gladys Knight, for Diana Ross. I opened at Harris in February of 2000. But I was the only singer who had, a, at that time, that had a theater named after him. It was the Clinton Homes Theater as long as I was performing there. You know, when I first started performing in Vegas, there was a name that at every hotel on the Strip. The first residency I ever had there on my own was at the Desert Inn. I remember recording the show for a TV special. People say... There's something in the lyrics and the storytelling that Smokey uses that you find a connection to. So take a good look at One morning, I said, what if a person had cried so much until their tears had made tracks in their face? If you look a little close, So The Tracks My Tears is uh, my most popular songs ever. Some of our most recent residencies, Prince. Las Vegas, y'all ready to do the work? Everybody was really shocked when they heard Prince was going to Las Vegas. Pull your cell phone out, call your next of kin. We about to get funky. Two, three, come on. Prince played in Vegas at the Aladdin Hotel in 2002, and he liked it so much that he came back to Vegas in 2007, and he opened up his own club, 3121 and it was unapologetically Prince. Thank you so much, Las Vegas. Don't hate me, because I'm fabulous. Soul of a Nation presents Black in Vegas airs tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central on ABC, and it will be available to stream tomorrow on Hulu. And that is our show for this hour. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. We're staying on top of a few things. Dangerous driving conditions, power outages, and travel delays, the impact of a deadly ice storm. And more from my exclusive sit-down with former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson discussing why he believes nations should send more aid to the Ukraine, especially the United States, and whether he'll ever return as Prime Minister. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. We're honored ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. In Washington, D.C., the mother of Karen Blake, a 13-year-old boy who was shot and killed, speaking out for the first time. Karen Blake was allegedly shot by a man who believed that he was tampering with cars. Jason Lewis was charged with second-degree murder and pleaded not guilty. In her speech today, London Blake said, I really hope that I get justice for my child, and I really hope this man is convicted to the highest. Attorneys General in 20 conservative-led states warned CVS and Walgreens that they could face legal consequences if they sell abortion pills by mail in those states. A letter from Republican Missouri Attorney General was co-signed by 19 other attorneys general, warning that sale of abortion pills would violate federal law and abortion laws in many states. CVS and Walgreens have said that they'll comply with state laws, even as they work toward certification to dispense abortion medication. On this, the first day of Black History Month and dripping in diamonds on a majestic horse, Beyonce sent her fans into a frenzy after the singer announced her long-awaited Renaissance World Tour. The tour will start in Europe in May, and she will make her way to the U.S. and Canada, ending in New Orleans at the end of September. Loved ones of Tyree Nichols celebrated his life before a final goodbye. The young father remembered today for his love of skateboarding and photography. And one of the most heartbreaking sights, his weeping mother describing her son through her pain. ABC Stephanie Ramos is in Memphis for us again tonight. Tonight, the family of Tyree Nichols laying the 29-year-old to rest three weeks after he died following a brutal police beating captured on disturbing video. Tyree was a beautiful person. And for this to happen to him, it's just unimaginable. Nichols, remembered by his family as a loving father, a beautiful soul who enjoyed skateboarding and sunsets. His sister, Kiana. I see the world showing him love and fighting for his justice. But all I want is my baby brother back. In the congregation, family members of George Floyd, Eric Gardner, Botham Jean, and Breonna Taylor, all of whom died at the hands of police. Vice President Kamala Harris in Memphis as well, embracing Tyree Nichols' mother before addressing the crowd. This violent act was not in pursuit of public safety. That's right. That's right. It was not in the interest of keeping the public safe. Was he not also entitled to the right to be safe? Reverend Al Sharpton with strong words against those five former Memphis police officers seen beating Nichols. In the city that Dr. King lost his life, not far away from that balcony, you beat a brother to death. Both Harris and Sharpton calling on Congress to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which calls for comprehensive police reform. Harris saying President Biden will sign it. Why do we want to see the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act passed? Because then you have to think twice for you beat Tyree Nichols. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. A deadly ice storm is still hammering parts of the country. Icy roads have been blamed for the deaths of at least six people. And tonight, more than 350,000 families and businesses are without power during this bitter cold. This weather has caused more than 5,000 flights to be canceled since Sunday. Our Maria Villarreal is in Texas with the latest details. Tonight, roads are like sheets of glass. Drivers spinning their wheels. On this curve south of Fort Worth, vehicle after vehicle going off the road. This pickup struggling to get back on the pavement. After hundreds of spinouts and accidents this week, tonight officials say the death toll on Texas roads has risen to at least six. When dozens of semis got stuck on I-20 in Dallas Tuesday, an army of Jeeps from a local off-road club sprang into action, hooking themselves together with tow ropes pulling those semis one by one. My dad's a trucker and I feel for them and I know I, I want to do everything I can to help them out. And I know they, the rest of the guys do too. In Austin, tree limbs snapping under the weight of ice. North of there, crews racing to clear blocked streets and repair utility lines torn by ice-encrusted trees. Across the state, more than 300,000 customers don't have power tonight. Across the country, airlines canceling more than 5,000 flights since the storms began. The residual effects could last days. 
Next to new FBI search, a new FBI search at a different one of President Biden's properties. Agents were seen today outside of the president's vacation home in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. This is the third site search for classified documents that the president may have. Our senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce reports from the White House. This morning, cameras catching the FBI arriving at President Biden's Delaware Beach home, where for three and a half hours they combed through every room. The White House says the president cooperated fully. Today, uh, in a planned uh, consensual search with the Justice Department, they went through the Rehoboth uh, Beach House uh, and no classified uh, marked documents were found. But the FBI did take some of Biden's handwritten notes from his time as vice president for further review. It comes 24 hours after we learned that agents searched the president's former private office back in November after Biden's lawyers found classified documents there. Today, we pressed the spokesman for the White House Counsel's Office on why the American people were informed about today's search, but not about the one in November. You're disclosing this search, but you did not disclose that the FBI also searched the president's former private office here in Washington. Do the American people have a right to know about that? Yeah, I think we've been pretty transparent from the very beginning with providing information as it uh, occurs throughout this uh, process. But why didn't you disclose I, I that think search? It's important to, to understand that as these things develop and as information develops throughout an investigation, we're trying to get you guys access to as much information as we can. Our thanks to Mary Bruce. These cases of classified records being found has really opened up a lot of questions about just who's responsible for keeping track of these documents. We're joined now by Bill Leonard, former Director of Information Security Oversight at the Office of National Archives. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, give us a sense, how does the government decide just which records should be deemed as classified? Well, the president has established the rules in an executive order. And uh, in that executive order, uh, out of millions of people with a security clearance, quite frankly, only several thousand have the authority to originally determine that information requires the protection of classification. Once that decision is made, any of the millions of people then who repeat that de uh, determination in another document, another email, another report, they're obligated to carry forward that, uh, that classification. It, what do you think of the argument that, that perhaps we're overclassifying documents, that they're being classified based on whether they're going to the president or vice president rather than actually any sensitive materials inside? That is absolutely the situation. Overclassification is a muck within the, uh, within the uh, federal government. You got to keep in mind that the that the classification system dates back to World War II, when if you wanted to create a classified document, you literally had to put pen to paper or sit at a typewriter and uh, 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 produce a, a single sheet of paper. Today, uh, you know, you just press a button and information uh, galore is is uh, is produced uh, in, to today, and and yet the system that we have for identifying and controlling classified information is still that system that was created 80 years ago. Ideally, when an official who's been given classified records leaves office, what process would they go through in order to turn them in? Well, basically, nobody should be have, should have uh, uh, documents within their individual possession. Every, uh, every office, every establishment has a security office that is staffed by security professionals. They're there to keep help keep track of what documents are in place and, and to ensure that they're not removed from a secure facility, from a secure location. And uh, before anyone uh, terminates their employment or, or what have you, there needs to be and there uh, should be in place a formal uh, process by which they uh, out process and and, and assure the security personnel that there is, in fact, no more classified information in their possession. How are classified records tracked? Should someone have been paying attention to, to whether any documents were missing? Is this essentially just an honor system? Uh, again, you know, uh, except for the, the most sensitive types of uh, classified information that are normally associated with what's known as a special access program, there is no tracking of individual class, classified, classified information. And so, uh, you know, uh, documents can be handed out at the beginning of a meeting. Uh, people refer to those documents during the course of the meeting. 
rarely does anyone collect them at the end. The 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 reliance is on individuals to uh, if if they do bring it back to their own office to put them into a burn bag if they're not going to uh, need to refer to them. Uh, there is no uh, official tracking of uh, the countless classified uh, pieces of material that's floating around the federal government today. So, Mr. Leonard, you said that this is all based on a, an 80-year-old system. When you see what's happening right now, what do you think needs to be done uh, to make sure that this doesn't keep happening decades from now? We have to bring the uh, classification system into the 21st century. The ability to, uh, to create, to reproduce, to uh, analyze information today uh, using automated tools and, and the likes. Uh, the, the same tools that allow you to produce uh, unlimited amounts of classified information, that same technology needs to be applied to be able to better identify what information should be classified in the first place and then track it uh, once it is, in fact, identified as being classified. Bill Leonard, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Now to more from our exclusive sit-down conversation with former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He's here in the U.S. to try and shore up Republican support for the war effort in Ukraine, and it's a war he never thought would happen in the first place. I thought then that Putin would be absolutely insane to invade and that the Ukrainians would fight and they would win. You didn't think that was going to happen? I didn't. I really didn't. I thought that he would be rational. And you know what I think happened? I think he was stuck in his kind of cocoon uh, with some very close advisors, and he got wrapped up in his kind of ideology about Ukraine, his, his weird kind of view that this isn't really a country, and he made a catastrophic mistake. How did your trip differ this past time than when you went in April, just a few weeks after the war began? When I got there, I got to be honest with you, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, hadn't really been out on a walkabout around Kyiv for uh, like six weeks because of the of the war. And my problem was that you know I I, I, I talked to him about everything that we wanted to do to help, but I, I needed the, I need a, a photograph of him and me in the street. Why was it so important for you to be the first leader from the West to actually have boots on the ground in Ukraine? I want to give a vis very visible statement of support. And you've got to remember, this was, I think, in April last year. And there was a lot of pressure on Ukraine to try to find some sort of arrangement, some sort of deal. Well, when do you see it being over? I mean, what's the end goal? We talked to a retired general last week who said, this is not just a matter of months. We're going to still be talking about it this time next year. It depends on what we give the Ukrainians. They're fighting like lions. They're brave. This is their country. This is a war of independence, right? You know, you fought a war of independence here in America. These things only go one way. This is their country. They're fighting for their land. Best case scenario, how long do you think it would take? A best case scenario, it could take a few months. You know, if they have the, if they have the the, the, the ATACMs, the the, uh, the long range uh, artillery fires, the deep fires that they need, if they have the armor, if they have the air support. Johnson says he's well aware of the massive financial burden the U.S. has already shouldered. So here, for really a relatively small outlay, you can achieve something. You can achieve a lasting settlement that will be much, much more cost effective. That doesn't mean I don't understand. And I'm not grateful for everything that, that America is doing. And by the way, I also understand how vital it is that we, uh, on the European side of the Atlantic, cough up and, and do more ourselves. How much more do we need to do? It sounds like Americans have already spent about $50 billion in aid. They've already pledged another $50 billion for this year. So we're talking about $100 billion. On the political landscape, I can understand your perspective, but for the average American who's saying, look, I'm struggling here with inflation and I know, interest but where's, rates. Where's that inflation come from? What, what caused it? That's been driven by economic instability, by, by oil price uh, spikes, caused directly by Putin's aggression. To push Putin back and you, and you fix a lot of potential economic problems in the future. Specifically, when you're talking to Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy, what are you asking for? 
So, the, so actually, so both uh, uh, Mitch McConnell and, Ke and Kevin McCarthy, I think, would be in the position of saying that they believe we should be doing more now. And I think they're kind of on the same page as, as me. Today happens to be the three-year anniversary of the UK uh, removing itself from the EU. Yes. Putin wanted, he desired, it was his hope that there would be destabilization in uh, the EU. Do you feel that Brexit brought that about? No, not at all. I think that actually, if you look at, if you look at Ukraine, uh, what, what really happened there, I'm sad to say, was that after, in 20, 2014, was the real moment of disaster. Because that was when he took, he went into Crimea and he, he went uh, into the Donbass. And, he, you know, what did we do? Did we punish him? Did the EU really punish him? No, no, no. When you left Parliament as Prime Minister, of course, you famously repeated the, the quote of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Many people thought that was a nod to a, another quote from the Terminator character that I'll be back. Any chance you'll well, be back? Well, look, I mean, you never say never in politics, and, uh, but I, the, the reality is that I'm, I'm, I'm living a, a, a happy, productive life. I'm churning out lots of, you know, thousands and thousands of words. Uh, I've got to write a lot of books and... No, I've got to write two books, I should say. If you ask me what, what, is, what is my passion at the moment, my passion is making sure that we do, we all do, what I think we're going to do anyway, which is help the Ukrainians. But it's not off the table that you might come back as prime minister. Uh, look, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that is... I'll move on. I that. think I normally say that that's about as likely... Well, before I ever became prime minister, I said that that was about as likely as being, as being blinded by a champagne cork or reincarnated as an olive or something like that. What's next for you? The books? I'm thudding away on my, on my computer. I am. I, I'm getting up at the crack and I'm staying up late. And you know what it's like. Books don't write themselves. You were very kind to, to have me on for so long. I mean, you know, well, I could, thank, thank you. you. Our thanks to Boris Johnson for the conversation. Still to come, details on the plot to kill the former Haitian president as four more men now face charges. And friends, romance, and a possibly cursed box actress Kaylee Montoroso Mejia tells us about her quirky new Netflix comedy series and the power of Latino representation on the screen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back.
Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. An indictment straight out of a spy thriller after four men were arraigned at a Miami federal court today accused of conspiring to kidnap or murder the former Haitian president. The embattled controversial leader was killed in his home in July of 2021, shot 12 times by a team of Colombian mercenaries. U.S. prosecutors allege that several Haitian Americans plotted to kill the sitting president and install a new leader, hiring nearly two dozen mercenaries to get the job done. A bond hearing for the suspect is scheduled for next week. Equatorial Guinea's president appointed his vice minister of education, Manuela Roca Bolte, as prime minister, making it the first time a woman has held the role in the West African nation. A country of about one and a half million people has had only two presidents since independence from Spain in 1968. Today is World Hijab Day, which was started exactly 10 years ago in recognition of millions of Muslim women who choose to wear the hijab and live a life of modesty, according to the World Hijab Day website. The idea serves as a way to foster personal freedom of religious expression and cultural understanding by inviting women from all walks of life to experience the hijab for one day. For anyone who misses On My Block, Netflix's new series, Free Ridge, is coming to save the day. The spinoff follows four teenage friends at the fictional Free Ridge High School in Los Angeles. Beyond dealing with family issues, sibling rivalry, and romantic tensions, the four friends must also deal with the distinct possibility that they unleashed a curse after opening a mysterious box that they got from a yard sale, which brings unforeseen misfortune into their lives and leashes them on a series of unforgettable adventures. Let's take a look. So we bought this cursed box, and now we're cursed because of it. Sorry, I don't do curses. You must be able to give us something. I do sense a dark energy around you. That's just Ines. No, all of you. Joining us now is actress Kayla Monteroso Mejia. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually so excited to be here. <laughs> oh, we are so excited to have you, Kayla. So talk to us about Free Ridge. It kind of picks up where On My Block left off. Uh, not completely. It's okay. the same world, but they're completely different shows. And uh, there's some, like, really fun Easter eggs in there, but it's a new adventure. Same but, neighborhood in yes, LA. same okay. neighborhood. So uh, I think the... The great thing <laughs> about the show is that I think the same essence that you get from On My Block is the same thing you get watching Free Ridge. They're both funny and heartfelt and very sweet, and it's a very easy watch. I'm really proud to be a part of it. Tell us a little bit about your character, Gloria, and what's in store for her in the season. Oh, my gosh. Gloria? <laughs> goes through a lot. She's a very strong, independent kid, and she shoulders a lot of the burden. She's sort of like the mom in the group, and she's in everyone's business. So it's a really fun adventure for her. And, and tell us a little bit more. So the idea is you guys are at a yard sale, you get this mysterious box, you yes. open it, and the curse comes out. And let me tell you, this curse creates problems on top of problems, things that you don't expect, but it's really fun to sort of be an adventure to watch. The things that they're going through are not the best, but it creates uh, a really good dynamic. And I think at the end of it, you really get to learn who your friends are and these really wonderful lessons along the way. So, All right, so this is a pretty high ex uh, the distinction that you were given from GQ recently. They called you a comedy secret weapon. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is really significant. <laughs> so, so you have been a part of a, a number of very successful shows, including Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm, where you actually play an actress who's not a very talented yes. actress. I want to take a clip, uh, a look at that. I wanted to talk to you about that David boy. Larry. Yeah, that's yeah. his name, Larry David. Well, what about him? I feel like you're being seductive right now. You're talking to your mother. Are, are we not close? In real life, do you ever talk to your mother like that? No, I don't seduce my mom. What is wrong with you? So what is oh, the God. trick when you're a great actress? How do you play a terrible one? You know what's really interesting? I was not thinking I was bad. I didn't go in there like thinking, oh, I'm going to be a bad actress. I thought I was good. <laughs> I thought I was the best. And I think the way that I approached it, I was like, I'm the best. And nobody could give me any direction. Nobody could do it better than I can. And I think the things that I did were a little like, extreme, but it worked. And the big note overall was always like, go bigger, go bigger. You can't go too big. And I think I really got to let loose and go as big as I could. <laughs> oh my God, I can see it. That's all. <laughs> If you were able to create your own perfect role, what, what would that be? 
Oh my God. Something, you know where I'd be like a chef? I would love that. Or try different jobs. I would love a show where I can maybe try like some extreme jobs. You know when the people clean windows that are just like 30 feet? I would love to do something like that. That'd be really cool. It'd do you sing? Fun. Do you sing also? Oh my God, not at all. Really? No. Because you started in the beginning kind of getting into like a little falsetto that I thought, no, oh, yeah. I wish, I wish I couldn't. You maybe, No. <laughs> it's not in the cards for me. <laughs> all right, so uh, here we are at the first day of Black History Month uh, intended to celebrate black culture. I'm curious as an actress where you think that uh, the culture is as far as Latino representation. I think we've definitely made some strides, but I think there is a long way to go. And truthfully, the, the reason that I'm here today is because of people who have worked really hard to open these doors. I'm not what you would typically see is accepting in Hollywood. I have a regular, like a regular face. And I, I'm- A beautiful face. Thank you, not in a self-deprecating way. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm, I'm five feet. There's just, I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. And the people who have worked really hard to get more representation, to fight to open these doors are the reason that I'm here. And I feel very grateful to be a part of maybe pushing that narrative forward and getting some more inclusion. And so I'm, I think we're in the right direction, but definitely have more to go. So proud of what you're doing and excited to keep watching your star rise, thank Kayla. You. Thank you so much for joining. We want to let our viewers know Free Ridge premieres globally February 2nd, only on Netflix. And still to come, one Michigan woman who's making a big splash with her art. Look at that. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> it was like working with a 40-year-old child. The housewife scam, the real life of Jen Shaw. Money. Six and a half years in federal prison. Jen Shaw, a fraud. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Memphis, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the snow, a Michigan woman is making waves online for her scary, cute shark sculptures. Reporter Alexandra Bahu from our partner station, WXYZ, introduces us to the fantastic artist. Just when you thought it was safe to walk near your neighbor's front yard. The sharks, they're blowing up on social oh my media. God, they're going nuts. <laughs> they're going nuts. Frosty the snowman better hold on to his hat because Jennifer Ramirez in Madison Heights has made jaws dropping sculptures outside her house. And has anyone shouted at you yet you're going to need a bigger yard? Uh, nobody has shouted that yet. Um, I, I get mostly that on Facebook. Wednesday we had the big snowfall um, and I shoveled all of it into a big old pile. Um, and then I think it was the next day I separated the piles and then started sculpting on Friday and finished them on Saturday. It's just too much fun. Everybody has so much uh, fun with it and, and they enjoy it and they appreciate it. But this isn't the first time Jennifer has made a splash with art in her community. In fact, we caught up with her in 2020, highlighting her fence artwork, bringing smiles to people when they needed it most. There's not enough joy in the world. And if I can, you know, share joy and through my art and bring joy, then I'm going to keep doing it. Jennifer is an artist and teacher, and for her, art is more than her profession. I love creating. I just love creating um, anything. You know, I try and instill that in my students. Hi, students. Um, but uh, I just, it's so much fun for me just to create. Move over snowmen. She's got something new and exciting there. 
Thanks so much for watching. That's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night.